Welcome to the new time zone. The, uh, the worst thing that you can do is to be a, a preacher in the new time zone, particularly in the spring. So thank you, Mark, for setting that up for me so nicely. Uh, we are in the study of the book of Proverbs, chapter 19. We're beginning in verse 8. This morning, I really uh, was thinking seriously about going all the way down to verse 13, six Proverbs, but I thought that might be too much. I thought to myself, who am I kidding? We'll never get there, but we have five this morning. I want you to know, I personally feel uh, a lot of pressure. Uh, I had lunch with... uh, Mr. Duncan yesterday, we were listening to, having lunch and listening to the melodious voice of Sam Cooke back in the 50s and 60s, and uh, he said, now I'm going to be watching you, so I feel the heat lamp on my forehead this morning. Uh, So not only am I fighting a new time zone, I'm fighting pressure. Uh, Here we are, Proverbs chapter 19, beginning in verse 8. The one who gets sense is the one who loves life. The one who needs understanding will soon find what is good. Nine, a perjurer will not escape punishment. And a witness to his lies will perish. Ten, luxury is not fitting for a fool. How much more for a slave to rule over a prince. Eleven, a man's prudence yields patience and his splendor is to pass over a transgression. Twelve, the roaring of a lion is the fury of a king, but like dew on vegetation is his favor. So those are our six proverbs, our five proverbs this morning. Here is the way I'm going to teach them. Uh, The good for the wise comes in varieties and in abundance. The good for the wise comes in varieties and abundance. And nine, the only issue for the liar is judgment when. The only issue for the liar is judgment when. And here is 10. The true ruler is the one who serves. The true ruler is the one who serves. And then here is 11. The wise know their great debt and should see transgressors the same way. The wise know their great debt and should see transgressors the same way. And finally, here is 12. Handle all people with care, especially those in power. Handle all people with care, especially those in power. So here we begin our first proverb, verse 8. The one who gets sense is the one who loves his life. In our last lesson, the previous proverb, verse 7, we were were pursuing. Now here we are getting the one who gets This is the motivation to work at acquiring. 
Look at line one, the one who gets. Line two is the one who heeds. So, together, they have a clear message. Wisdom, the skill for living, gives the word sense. Here is mental capacity, ability. Ability to know, to understand, to comprehend. Now, in the New Testament, we know that to be the endowment of the Holy Spirit that has regenerated us. The natural man does not understand the things of the Spirit of God. They are foolishness to him. But by the power of the Spirit, we are renewed in our minds. Our minds are actually changed. And we have an ability, a supernatural ability, to understand God's Word. The Old Testament didn't have that terminology. It had the word wisdom, it had the word prudence, it had the word understanding. But that is, in effect, what is being described here. The skill for living gives one the middle capacity to know and to understand. So here's line two. It gives also the moral capacity to obey what the Scriptures command. Now, we know that to be the Spirit as well. The Spirit of God gives us the ability that is not natural to the natural life. The one who loves his life, and line two, will find what is good. Now, let's look together at some of the detail to the proverb itself. First of all, to love. In the Old Testament, that is to desire something strongly, but faithfully. Not just strongly, but faithfully. As opposed to instant gratification. Here's an example of the use of the word. Genesis 29.20, 20, a very famous passage. We all know Jacob served Laban seven years for Rachel. And they seemed to him but a few days because, and here's our word, because of the love he had for her. Same word. To love is to dedicate oneself to something in the Old Testament. That's Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 5. You are to love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, so, to love is to dedicate oneself. And by the way, that's the oath that you took when you stood before a minister of the Word and witnesses that you would love all the days of your life. Here in the top line, love means that we so embrace wisdom that we do exactly what the Word declares. We dedicate ourselves to it. We focus on it. We skinny our lives down, if you will, like we're going sideways through a passage. Whatever it's necessary to do to move forward in wisdom. And that's the Scriptures. To know them and to put them into practice daily for our lives. Let's always consider what we know to be true. Your life is not your own. Specifically here, here's what the Apostle taught us. 1 Corinthians 6.20, You were bought with a price, therefore honor God with the way you live. So it is the mental capacity to know, and it is the ability to put it into practice what you know. And what do we know? That our body is not our own. Our mind is no longer our own. We have been purchased by Him, and it is reflected in a daily walk. And when a man does that, he can't miss 
the things that God would have him to do in life. Look at line two. You will, look at this word, find. Unfortunately, it's left out of the NIV, but that's the word. You will find good. Now, find is implied by the fact that it's waiting for you. It's been placed there for you in order for you to find. The trail has been made by wisdom. Follow the trail and you will find. That's the idea. You remember Proverbs 2, 7. We talked about the victories that are in store for the wise. They're all locked up in a box, like at a bank, in a special vault with your name on it, especially made for you. They are victories that He gives you by virtue of your walk in wisdom. Look at that word good. Let's spell that out for us. Good here is rather broad term. Nothing specific here. All the things that God gives, and He's giving them to you in abundance. Now, let's think about this. And I'm going to show you how that word is put into practice, and you'll never forget it. It comes actually from the first chapter of Genesis. Genesis chapter 1, the creation story. We've read it over and over and over again. God created out of nothing. And then at the end of the page, verse 31. Genesis 1, 31. Here it is. God saw all that He had made, and it was... And there's our word. Our word from Proverbs 19, 8. Good. Now let's think about that. How many things did He create? All in that first chapter. Varieties and in abundance over and over again. Unpredictable things. They came out of nowhere because He just spoke them into existence. That's what He is going to bring to the life of the believer that follows wisdom. Good things in abundance, in variety. Over and over. Good. He can do more for you than you can ever do for yourself. How many times do we have to learn that? Walk in wisdom. God will find you. And you will find the good that He has made for you. That's Genesis 1. And that's working with the same word right here. Here's 9. A perjurer will not escape. And you will find all the good that He has for you. Our verse is almost identical to 19.5. 19.5, a false witness, a falsehood, perjure will not escape punishment, and a witness to lies will perish. Our verse is almost identical right here. So you, just a few short comments to make. First, falsehood, perjury, bearing false witness. Those things should never be mentioned among the righteous. They should never be... Uh, put with our own testimony associated with us in any way. That's the old life. That's the old man that we were. Flying through life by the seat of our pants, manipulating, lying, contorting, any way we could to scheme. That was the old life. Put it away. It's not a part of wisdom. God has a plan and purpose for you and He's going to allow you to find the good that He has for you in this new life. And it's far greater than anything for yourself. Falsehood, perjury, bearing false witness, playing the fool. I can still remember 
listening to Donald Gray Barnhouse. I've mentioned this to you before. Reel-to-reel tape from the 50s and that beautiful voice of his. Christians can make great fools of themselves, he would say. Never forgotten that line. Well, that's, that's what we are fighting against by walking in wisdom. That's why the entire cosmos was created by wisdom. Every tick of the clock is determined by wisdom. And it tells us that He has planned the end of all things in all of creation. So this morning we set our clocks. They are programmed for us. And when the alarm went off, we heard the alarm. That's the program that God has set for the universe. So you walk in wisdom. You walk in the creation. You're walking in the very way He has created all things. That's why the fool ultimately will perish. Because he is swimming upstream against all that God has created and the way He has created it. There's no happily ever after for the wicked. That's in the movies. No, this is the truth. This is God's Word. The perjurer will not escape punishment. So let's uh, flesh that out for just a moment. Let's think of the perjurer, the liar, from the very beginning. Who was it? He was in the garden. What did he tell the woman? He told her that you surely will not die. What do the book of Proverbs say? Lying lips are just for the moment. They don't last. It's not truth etched in the air forever. No. It fades away. It's like vapor. So she got through the day. She didn't die. Lying lips were for the moment. But she did die. The man died. Of course, they died spiritually, but... They died physically, and they've been dying ever since. You and I die because of what went on in the garden. And so the liar from the beginning has proven himself to be just what he is. He's a liar. And the liar will not go unpunished. Here it is, Revelation chapter 20 and verse 10, For him and the devil who deceived them, was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are and shall be tormented night and day forever and ever again. They will perish. It's a future certainty from the Word of God and from the Proverbs of God. In the end, the sentence of wisdom shows itself always to be true. Here's 10. Luxury is not fitting for a fool. This is a proverb about the appropriate social arrangement of things. It's not right for fools who do not have the skill for living to live in ease, to live in abundance. And line two, servants are to serve, not rule. Look at our top line. It opens luxury. A very interesting word. It's one who has a tense in that verb and translated to be soft. You've heard people say, well, that person now has the soft life. That's the word, and that's the idea of the word. In Proverbs 30, 22, it is equated with an abundant table. A slave when he becomes a king, and a fool who is filled with food. It's just not right. That's the point. The soft life of luxury is not right for a fool. That's what the proverb is saying. So it is luxury for a fool here, 
And it is portrayed in the Proverbs as an upside-down world. That's what's going on. The incorrigible fool who lives the good life and such a life seemingly invalidates the blessing of God upon the righteous person. It's like God didn't really tell us the truth. It's like, uh, this is not what I learned from the Scriptures. That's what tormented Asaph. Psalm 73, I was envious of the arrogant as I saw the prosperity of the wicked. No pains in their death, and their body is fat. That means they had all the abundance of the things of this life. They are not in trouble as other men, nor are they plagued like people. And that's what he saw. And it drove him crazy. He almost lost his faith over it. Now look at the proverb. It says, how much more? That's an uh, application of logic. The weightier argument is a slave to rule over princes. In other words, the incompetent and former subordinate now is governing the rulers, the ruling class. That's the idea. So let's define our terms carefully because it will help us to understand the proverb. Here's David. David explaining to us what a real ruler is and his behavior. It comes from 2 Samuel 23. He says, The God of Israel has spoken. The rock of Israel has said to me, When one rules justly over men, Ruling in the fear of God. Now listen to the benefits when you have someone like that. He says, He dawns on them like the morning light, like the sunshine, forth on a cloudless morning, like rain that makes grass to sprout from each direction. What's that a picture of? It's a picture of growth, of prosperity, of advancement, to and for all men everywhere under that ruler's regime, his kingdom. That's the idea. That's what a righteous ruler produces. That's what a righteous ruler, like Jacob, who had a son by the name of Joseph, produced in Egypt, he was a slave at one time in Potiphar's house. But he was a wise man. And so when he got to power, what did he do? He fed the known world. That's what he did. He was there for common people everywhere. Not just for the ruling class, but for all men everywhere. That's what David is saying here. So the advancement of a comfortable fool living way above his pay grade, making life and death decisions. How can he rule in fairness and equity? He can't. doesn't have the ability. He's a slave. Want an example? Saddam Hussein. I remember prior to the war with Iraq, they showed black and white film of him, and particularly his party. He was the head of the Bath Party. He was up on a stage behind a desk, smoking a big cigar, and all the members of the Bath Party were there in the audience, in the auditorium. And he took out a piece of paper and he began to read, here's a name. And they would come down and they would take the man out. And it didn't take long before the men in the bath party there, the audience, to realize this is a public execution. And men began to cry out as they carried them, dragging their feet up the aisle. That's a slave ruling. That's a picture of it. 
incompetent, drunk on his feelings of power. And he puts people under his thumb and makes them suffer. There it is. Slowly but surely under his leadership. And the righteous, we're interested in the ordinary person. And we're interested in benefiting them, prospering them, and serving them. That's what real leadership does. When we take the Lord's table here in the morning, those men that come and wait on that table and serve it to you, they're the real leaders. That's the leaders here. They're the servers. They work to benefit you. Take note of them. Point them out to your children, your grandchildren. Here is a man of leadership among us. That's who they are. They're serving. You see, that's the future. That's the future for all of us. Those who serve us here, they are just living representatives of the future reality to come. That's what the Lord Jesus told us in Matthew chapter 20 and verse 16. The last will be first, and the first will be last. We're not interested in the economy of the world. We're interested in the economy of the future. And the men who serve have distinguished themselves to be leaders among us. And we should recognize them for their service of leadership. Here's 11. A man's prudence yields patience and his splendor Remember that word. Splendor is to pass over a transgression. We have referenced in the past lessons Joseph's prudence before the Pharaoh, his wisdom, the ability to interpret dreams, to uh, grasp the implications of a situation and a message. That's why he went straight away and begin to survey the land to build the silos. See, he was thinking in light of this abundance that God was going to produce. That's applying God's Word to our minds and the implications of it. And that's called prudence. A prudent man can see and understand what others cannot. And here we are in our proverb instructing us on a skill that can't be seen or easily understood. But here it is. True advancement in the Lord comes by and through patience. Now the world tells you just the opposite. It's the eager beaver. It's outworking people. It is getting up earlier, doing more, staying focused. That's not what the proverb says. Look at our top line reads, yields patience. We've discussed the wisdom of patience previously, literally making the face long. That's, this language is so picturesque, but that's the idea of patience, relaxing the face. A patient person rules. He rules his spirit. He rules his emotions. He's a man that can take a city, a great feat in the ancient world. Look at this virtue here, line two. It's called splendor. The prudent person's patience is likened to splendor. That's some attractive adornment. You look at a military uniform, and it's very plain Jane. But you put those 
flags and badges on that uniform, and it takes on a whole different reference. Our eyes are attracted to those flags and badges and all that regalia there. That's what this word splendor is. It adorns our life. Patience. Like medals on a uniform. And so, to, here is our word, to pass over. It's literally to pass along, to pass by. The lexicon translates it to overlook. We call it forgiveness. It's the way we talk in Texas. We forgive you. Well, here's our word, used in the famous vision of the plumb line of Amos, Amos 7, 8. And the Lord asked, what do you see, Amos? A plumb line, I replied. Then the Lord said, look, I'm setting a plumb line among my people Israel, and I will, and now here is our word, translated in the English Standard Version as to pass by, the New American Standard translates it spare, spare them. So it is the idea of forgiveness. That's what the, the Passover was. The houses of Israel behind the blood were passed over. But the Passover angel that came over the houses of the Egyptians, there was death and destruction. Passed over Israel in Goshen. Paul says he passed over all the saints of the Old Testament. Matter of fact, because the blood of bulls and goats could not cleanse from sin. So he forgave their transgression waiting for Christ and His ultimate sacrifice. It's a marvelous thought in the apostle's great mind. Finally, look at transgression. This is a violation against the wise in the proverb. What are we to do? What is wisdom? We are to pass over it, pass by it. As believers, we, that is our calling. That is our conduct. One to another. Luke 11.4 Forgive us our sins as we forgive everyone that sins against us. That's the skill for living. You see, here's the principle. I get up every morning and I have a great debt. Great debt. How great is my debt? As big as Mount Everest? That's as big as I can think about. I get up with that every morning. Now, how am I going to get rid of Mount Everest? With a shovel? I have maybe a spoon. I am lost. I can't remove that debt. And yet God in His grace said, I've wiped it all away. Where Everest was, now is barren. That's what He did for me. Now, you come along and sin against me. What's the size of your debt? A car? A bus? A briefcase? I don't stumble over that. He has forgiven me Mount Everest. That's the idea. The skill for living. I need daily forgiveness from Him because of my great debt. And I forgive you because your debt couldn't possibly be as great as my own. That's the proverb. Here's 12, our final. The roaring of a lion is the fury of a king. But like dew on vegetation is his favor. What a timely proverb for me right now. In divine providence, kings are placed into power, rulers, elected officials. We are called by the apostle to pray for them. And 
That is what he told Timothy to do, to pray. Kings in the ancient Near East held absolute power, life and death by their voice. They appealed to no judges. They had no congress or representatives that they had to twist arms to get a vote for. No, it was all in their own minds. So we are to practice wise forgiveness, restraining patience. That's the idea. The contrast is here in the proverb, the unbridled restraint of a king's anger. And it's depicted for us in the proverb as a lion's roar. This word roaring is the raging of the heart that causes the lion to open its mouth. And when he does, he terrifies us. The lion is the proud sovereign that catches and devours his victim. In antiquity, the lion has been used to represent strength and ferocity. Genesis 49, Judah, the prophecy given to the son of Jacob. Here it is. Judah is a young lion. My son, you return from the prey like a lion. He crouches, he lies down like a lioness who dares to rouse him. You never wake up a lion. That's the picture. And this makes Judah the agent of God's sovereign power. He becomes the great leader. That's why he is to receive praise from his brothers due to his regal authority. Fury here. Like a king. It's the hot temper of a dangerous and dreadful monarch who is the messenger of death by his voice. Now the wise person is careful with that messenger. But puts together for us two figures. Look at your proverb. We have two figures here. The first is dew. That's life-giving moisture, penetrating, refreshing, reviving. It was the essential climatic condition of Palestine in a hot and arid climate. Do. That's the first figure. Notice the word like. That's a comparison. That's a simile. So we are to think about the comparison. What is it? Well, the wise person is like dew on vegetation. Now, last time I was here, I mentioned my father. I got a lot of, I got a lot of questions and discussions about that afterwards. He came as an unbeliever. He left Believer's Chapel in his death as a believer. And people wanted to know more about that. His observation was he was astonished that we didn't pass a plate in the morning meeting. How were we going to survive? How could this place function that way? Well, here's another thing that I remembered as I was going through this proverb. All of the people, the men of the congregation that reached out to him and befriended him before and after he became a believer. He, had, he knew no one as a believer. But the men of this congregation reached out to him in fellowship and they brought refreshment to his life. That's what I remember. That's what I recall. And it reminds me, that's what we should be about. We should be refreshing one another all the time. Here's your proverb, 11.25. A generous person will prosper. He who refreshes others will himself be refreshed. This should be a place where we build one another up. Encourage one another. Make friendships. That's the real picture of the do. And then, 
Look at this word vegetation. You see, that's the product. That's the end result of all that you've done to harvest in an agrarian economy. You've got to protect the vegetation. So, wisdom is careful with rulers. They're careful with people of power. They're careful with people of prestige. Now, we do that very simply by living our lives serving. We don't have to worry about if he's a four-star general or a five-star general, if he's a senator, a congressman, a mayor. We don't care. We serve all men. And that's the way we function. What can I do for you today? How may I serve you today? You see, you live like that. You're protecting the vegetation. That's the proverb. Go ask a good attorney. What's his attitude toward a judge in the courtroom? Ultimate authority. He's wise and careful in everything he says. You know, this all hovers around one word in this proverb. And with this I'll close. It's the word favor. How many times have we talked about favor in the Proverbs? Well, I buried a man who was an unbeliever. He, uh, when I first met him, he hated the pipeline company that I worked for. I thought he was going to kill me as a representative of that company in my first meeting with him. One of the toughest individuals I've ever known. Blew his arm off climbing through a fence when he was 14. Became super wealthy, very powerful. And I kept saying all these years, why in the world would he show me favor? Until I studied the word favor. I realize favor comes from above. It has nothing to do with relationships this way. It is God working upon the heart of another person. My friends, you and I have the opportunity every day to be people of favor. I encourage you to do that. You be the blessing. You be the freshman. People are the vegetation. We treat them with care because they're important. And they're important for you and I because that is the service we render to a great God and a great King. We fear Him. And we don't want to hear His roar ever in our lives. That's the proverb. Let's pray. Thank You, Father, for our time to study together today. Thank You for these people that love Your Word, that came an hour early to hear Your Word, because they love You, Lord, and they desire to know You better. And that's the wisdom that You give us for living. Skill. Give it to us in abundance. Give us Give us your blessing in a variety of ways over and over as we follow your path through life and live for you, not counting others' transgressions against us, but like you, emulating you, forgiving and living life to its fullest, which is the skill that You have provided from the beginning of creation to the very end that we know it in the Scriptures. All by wisdom. Wisdom from above. In Jesus' name, Amen.